it's really great to be back in Jupiter, Palm Beach and the Max Planck Institute that was founded here some years ago. And uh, I'm so happy to see the success of this institute that has come out of the work of so many people, many of them here in the audience tonight. I see Nasser sitting down here, who I worked a lot together with, David, of course, and many others. So, so it's really wonderful to be back and, and see how this institute is thriving. Okay, uh, so tonight I wanna take you on a journey into the world of smelling. And, and I will go way beyond the insects uh, because I wanted to give you a more popular view, a, a, more, a more general view of, of what the sense of smell is and, and what it means to us and to many other animals. Here you see an insect, of course, and, and I will return to the insect towards the end of my talk, but I want to start with how, how do we smell? And, and what does it mean to smell? It, it's something different, right? Uh, first, I wanted you to think about seeing, because every color you see here around you, and now it's dark, but you have white on the screen, you have red over there, you have some other colors around you, right? All that you can see with three receptors, red, blue, and gre green. That's all you need to, to form all those impressions. And that's because visual impressions are all formed by one type of stimulus. It's a waveform, and that waveform comes faster or slower, and it forms different kinds of colors, right? But every molecule that you smell is a unique stimulus. It's not a waveform in different forms. It's something new. So that's why you have 400 receptors in your nose, not three, but 400. So it's really something else, and, and that's what I want to try to explain a bit to you. So here, here we have representatives. You, you see the, the insect to the left with its antenna. The antenna is the insect nose. And then you have us, the mammals, and that's uh, the mouse Howard sitting here in the middle. And, and what makes us able to smell are those little structures that you see at the bottom there. Those are seven transmembrane receptors and they act like little locks in your nose. And when the right molecule comes and fit into those locks, then it releases nerve action and the signal is sent to your brain and it tells, ah, there was this, there was this kind of smell, right? So if we look at the system overall, there is the apple, there's a lot of molecules. It's about three, 400 different kinds of molecules coming from an apple but you, your nose doesn't detect all of those, but it has cho evolution has chosen 10 or 20 of those that are important to identify this as an apple, right? But then your nose is also good enough to say, say that this is a Granny Smith, or this is an aroma apple, and so on, right? So, so your nose is so good at picking up those different kinds of molecules. The message is then sent to the olfactory bulb in your brain. That's a structure as big as the front of your little finger sitting in here. And there it's connected in little balls called glomeruli. And, and that's the message then paints, it paints a map in your brain, a topographical map that is the representation of those different kinds of odors. And I will come back to that in a while. But first as a background, and as Many of you are Americans and can be really proud because there were, there were many Max Planck uh, Nobel Prize winners up there. Here we have Linda Buck and Richard Axel, who to 2004 got the Nobel Prize for finding those receptors. It was an enigma until then, until around 2000, when they, when they were able to find those receptors in the rat. And the rat has 1,400 of them, not... 400, but 1,400. Actually, the absolute master of the number of receptors is the elephant. You can almost see it on the animal, right? <laughs> it, it has 2,400 receptors, and that's the most that we know of so far. But, but, but these people were so important in creating an understanding and creating a quantum leap in how we understand olfaction. So now I want to connect back to the science meets music. So let's look at this. So if we go to your nose, I just told you that you have 400 receptors, right? 
but you can smell millions of different odors. How is that possible? Well, that is possible because those different molecules play your receptors like a piano. So if you think of a piano with 400 keys, how many melodies can you play? Pretty many, right? Some researchers say we can smell an innumerate number of odors. And some say it's a m millions, but <laughs> who cares? It's hard, it's hard to, to put the exact number, right? But that is possible because of these combinations all the time. So, so there is like a little piano in your brain constantly being played by all those keys sitting in your, in your nose, right? And that makes it possible to smell so many different kinds of odors. So that's, that, that's about our specific sense of smell, right? And, and now I want to go into different kinds of smelling in different kinds of animals so that you get quite a broad sense, because often we think that some animals, they don't smell, and they, they, they don't care about this sense or that sense. But I will, I will take you into a world where I will show you how important smelling is to all of us. And of course, the first animal I want to touch on is us. How, how, how important is smelling to us? Well, it's, it's really super important. And, and many of us really enjoy food, or we really enjoy a good wine. And all of that, we call it taste, but it's 90% smelling. So if you take a really nice red wine next time you're in the restaurant and you hold your nose while you're drinking it, then you will notice that you could just as well have a cheap vino tinto because it, the, the, all, the, all the deep notes, all the wonderful notes, they're gone. I test my students. I give them mustard and ketchup but I cover their eyes and th then they have to hold their nose and no one can tell the difference. And then you open your nose, ah, it's ketchup. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's really, it's so obvious to us what is ketchup and mustard, but it's all retronasal smelling. So it, when you take some food into your mouth, then the odor molecules travel backwards and up into your nose. And that's where you get the bouquet, the, the notes of the food and of the wine, right? So, so smelling is so important to us. Also, the connection between mother and child, between father and child, between partners, signals between humans that are often subconscious. We are not so aware, but we are all aware that a little baby smells wonderful on top of its head, right? It has this sweet, soft... We did some experiments together with my wife, who sits in the audience. When our kids were small, we couldn't uh, avoid doing some experiments, of course. <laughs> so so, so we, 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 uh, we asked the maternity ward if we could, if we could get some kids together and, and collect some odors, and, and we did. And, and, and then it was clear when we asked people, it, it, they, they all said, oh, it's wonderful, it's sweet, it's vanilla, it's, it makes me in a very good mood, and so on. So, so, so there is obviously some pheromones involved. Pheromones, you, you all know hormones, right? That's chemical messenger inside your body. Pheromone is the chemical messenger between individuals of the same species. So here is really something going on with connections between people. Also some cool experiments done by a colleague who is uh, based in California, now in Israel. Um, he, he tried to see how good are humans actually at following an odor trail. So, so the yellow line here, which wasn't visible, um, that's chocolate. So, so, so he, he put a trail of cho chocolate along the lawn and then he asked this person who cannot feel anything, cannot see, cannot hear, to, to track that chocolate. And, and it was possible. And I want you to look at the track. And this is something I come back to. It's typical when you want to follow an odor track that you zigzag. Because you cannot really follow a concentration gradient, but you know when you're off track. And then you zigzag back, and then you're on track. And then you follow the track like this. And I'll show you some other examples. But this person was extremely slow compared to other animals. <laughs> But in the end, she got to the goal. So, so it, it worked, but I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> Another kind of experiments that have been done are the classical T-shirt experiment. So, so these were done in Switzerland by a guy called Wedekind. And he, 
he asked women to choose the t-shirt of men that they liked the best. And, and what he could show was that when women are in the ovulate, ovulatory phase, they choose the t-shirts of men that are genetically different. But when they are in between ovulations, they choose the odor of their brother. And it makes sense, right? Well, you, you want to mate with someone who has a complementary immune system, but in between you want to be someone who you can trust, your brother. So, so, so this, this was the interpretation that he came up with, at least. I'm, I leave it to him. Um, also, experiments have been done with... Uh, this have, was done up in Chicago, where, the, where a female scientist did classical experiments letting women stay together. And what she claimed was that the odors among these women made them synchronize their menstrual cycles. So th this was the, the whole truth for a long time. Now people have been trying to recreate these experiments and it hasn't really been successful. So, so right now we're doubting if this is really true and it's also hard to find the sense in why it would be good to do that. But maybe there is something in it. But in the end of the human story here, I of course want to bring in this one, because this is what put it on the map for many of you, right? We got COVID and many who got COVID lost the sense of smell. And when you lose something, then you know what it's worth. Then you know that so many qualities in life disappear when you cannot smell. And, and that, has, that has put olfaction on the map of, of many people today. Okay, now I want to leave the humans for a while and I want to go home to my place in the forest. And there is uh, another creature living there. This one, or this one. And this is a super smeller, right? A dog, you can never imagine what a dog can tell with his or her nose. It, it, it's about a thousand times more sensitive than ours, but that doesn't tell everything. You, you have to consider that a dog can smell something 10 meters underwater by the molecules seeping up through the water. A dog can tell where you walked three days ago by the molecules seeping through your soles and can follow that track in the right direction. It's just amazing what dogs can do. And, and when you take your dog for a walk, right, you take the same round, you walk around the block and it's really boring because it's the same, it's the same trip every day. But for the dog, it's something new every time because the dog sees history or smells history. The dog can smell, ah, there, there was, there, there, there was a, a competitive alpha male who was there last night and there was a sexy female who is going into heat in two weeks and there was a badger running over the track, right? And he or she, the dog, can really imagine this and form pictures in his brain about all these impressions that we, it's so boring for us, but it, new things all the time for the dog. And if we then look, how does a dog look for a prey, if we have a hunting dog like mine, right? Well, then we come back to this zigzagging pattern that I showed you before. So, so here is a dog with red diodes on its collar and then there was a pheasant with a yellow diode, right? So the pheasant was walking and the dog is trying to find the pheasant. So it, again, it does this zigzagging pattern trying to, find, trying to find the pheasant. So hunting dogs is of course one way that we use animals to smell, right? But there are so many uses for dogs because dogs are reasonably long lived and they can be trained. So we use them for sniffing out things. When, when you get to customs in Miami, at least we as foreigners have to spend a long time there, uh, then they use them to find money. They use them to find drugs. They use them to find electronics. You use them now to sniff for COVID. Uh, you use them to sniff for cancer. They can identify different kinds of cancer in different kinds of people, right? And we even use them to detect insects. This is a dog that is specialist in finding bark beetle infected spruce trees. So you can train a dog for anything, more or less. And again, we can never imagine what the dog can smell. He can smell it. Okay, let's look at another smell master. The mouse. The mouse 
life is totally smell dependent. Whatever a mouse does, if it comes to food, if it comes to finding a mate, oops, now we're stuck there, if it comes to taking care of your pups, if it comes to avoiding a predator, the mouse is using smell. And in the, in the interaction with the opposite sex, it's so intricate. For instance, if a female is pregnant and a new male enters the territory, then she resorbs her fetuses because evolution knows that the new male will kill the pups when they're born because he wants her to go into estrus as fast as possible. So it's, and it's enough with the smell. You don't have to have a new male there. It's just the smell of a new male that has this strong effect on the female. There is a number of these effects that have, have been investigated about the mouse. And to do this, the mouse has not one, but four noses. It has a normal nose, and it has a special nose for pheromones in its upper part of its mouth. It has a special nose to detect lethal danger right at the tip of the nose, called the Grüneberg ganglion. And then it has a fourth nose that we don't know what it does. But smelling is so important for these animals that, that again, we, we cannot really understand it. What about fish? We all eat salmon, right? We love salmon. So, and we know that salmon, they are born in a creek, they live there for a while, then they swim out in the ocean, they live for a long time in the ocean, then they need to find their way back. Well, they do that by smelling. So when they live in that little creek, then they learn the odor of that creek, and then they can find their way back. First they go by orientation among the currents and so on, but when they get to the outlets to find the right one, then they go up the current and through the smell. Same we think happens with the eel, but that goes the other way around. It goes out into the ocean to find the Sargasso Sea to, to reproduce. Leaves, leave this one, but the shark, of course, we have all been out fishing shark maybe and throwing some blood in the water and trying to get them. Well, it's not so clear that the sharks are super smellers, but they definitely use it to some extent. But of course, with these animals, it also becomes different because for us, it's clear smelling is in the air, tasting is in water solution, right? But for a fish, you're always in the water. So then the distinction, of course, becomes what do you use your nose for and what do you use your tongue for? So what the fish uses the nose for, those are the smells. Here are some other guys who live in the water, the whales. And for a long time, it was said that mammals who went back to the sea, right? The whales and the seals and the walruses, they were once on land, but then they went back into the sea. It was said that they lost their sense of smell. But it's not true. So some research got together with the Inuit people up in Alaska and they went along hunting whales and then they could extract the nose of the whale and the brain of the whale and then they could show that these kind of whales, the baleen whales, they have very good sense of smell. So do the seals. And they all smell a specific odor that is connected to plankton. And where there is plankton, there is fish. So they can smell it, right? On the other hand, it seems true that these guys cannot smell. So the toothed whales, they cannot smell. And why that is, no one knows. Maybe evolution made a mistake. What about birds? That was one, you have an, a very classic ornithologist called Audubon, who worked a lot on birds in America. And he claimed that these guys, they cannot smell. They're absolutely useless. They, they just look for something and they find it. Totally wrong, because then there was another famous American, Betsy Bang, who found that these animals have a huge brain center for olfaction, so obviously they smell. And then very nice experiments were done on specifically the turkey vulture. This was over Jupiter Beach Hotel yesterday. Um, <laughs> they were looking for me, maybe. Uh, <laughs> they, they, they have an excellent sense of smell, right? Also, the albatross. The albatross can also smell exactly the same odor coming from plankton that I talked about the seal and the whale before. The problem that that odor, dimethyl sulfide, is the same odor that comes from deteriorating plastic. That's why we find the belly full of plastic, also in little turtles. 
So it's really a bad thing with all the plastic out there. Here is another one, also the penguins. They use odors to connect between the sexes. This one has a tangerine smell in the nape behind his head. and They sit and cuddle together and then they smell this nice pheromone. So now let's step over to my speciality where we started. Uh, let's look a little bit at the insects. You know, we are about 20,000 species of mammals. There is probably about 5 million species of insects out there. So, so this planet is really the planet of the insects. And that's why I've always been fascinated by this, because they have adapted to every corner of the world, of the environment that you can imagine, right? So here is the one I talked about before, the bark beetle. You know what kind of problems we have with them today? They build these galleries under the bark of the spruce. They form these wonderful, beautiful, uh, typographic, it's actually called ips typographis in Latin. Beautiful patterns, but unluckily they kill the tree. Um, so these guys, when they are trying to gather enough force to kill the huge tree, they have a come pheromone. They say, come, 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 I'm, I'm here now. I want the female and I also want more friends because we have to kill this big organism. The tree is trying to defend itself by resin, so there be, need to be many, but when it's full and we still don't understand, then they change their pheromone and say, stop, this tree is full, fly to the next one. And how they know that this tree is full now, we have no idea. But it's all built on odors and chemistry between these animals, right? One of these females produced 30 to 50 larvae. Normally it's about one, it's a one generation per year. Now with climate change, we get two or three. Then you can start adding up. 50 times 50 times 50. Then you get this. So it's really something that is going on over the world. The attacks in Canada we can see from the moon. We can see how the forest is dead in Canada. All of Northern Europe and Central Europe is dying when it comes to spruce. So right now we, are, we own our own forest. So we are shifting over to other species of trees because this is a huge problem right now. Of course, we're trying to use these pheromones to guide these beetles to other places and so on, but it's, it's very hard. So let's now look at the real smell masters. This is a moth, right? Male moth. So if we take the Baltic Sea, that's my neck of the woods, if you drop one packet of sugar, one kilogram of sugar into the Baltic Sea, then you take a ladle and you turn around the whole sea and then you taste it, then you should be able to taste that it's now sweeter. That's the kind of concentration that this male can detect from the female sex pheromone. Impossible to understand, right? So he can detect one to 10 molecules in a sugar cube size, while we need 200 million molecules for the compounds that we are most sensitive to. So it's a sensitivity that we just, it goes way, way, way. The dog went beyond us, but <laughs> now we are really. <clears throat> and, and this is interesting because here we're talking about something else. Here we're talking about what we call a labeled line. A labeled line means that now we're not playing piano anymore. Now we're just hitting one key, but we're hitting that key hard as hell. And it only means there is a female sitting up there and the only thing in my head now is to find her. So let's look at these guys. This is a silk moth sitting here. We have been domesticating these for thousands of years, so they're so fat so they cannot fly, but still they behave. Now we get a girl there. Look at the boys. <laughs> they get quite excited. And of course they're trying to fly, but they cannot fly, but, but they will he will still do the zigzagging. He's trying to do the zigzagging to find her, see? Hmm, very nice female up there. And slowly he makes progress. And in the end, he gets his reward and she. And, and then it happens what should happen. So, so th th this is the only thing that goes into the brain. A big chunk of the male ma brain is just dedicated to finding the female here, right? Okay, but, but when you have such a behavior, it's a little bit dangerous also, right? 
It's a little bit like, like a reflex. So if, if you put your hand on a hot plate, you pull it back, right? These, these insects, they, they don't really think. <laughs> but if it smells like this, you just have to go there. So of course, that can be exploited by other organisms, by devious organisms, like these flowers. So on the left, you see an orchid. And you can almost see that it looks like an insect, right? It has exactly the right reflection on the back that is like the wings of a female. And it smells. It produces exactly the same blend of odors that the female emits of a special wasp. So the poor male, he flies to this flower and he tries to mate. And then the flower puts two pollen corns on his, uh, on his uh, head and then he flies away and then he gets fooled to the next flower. And then he transfers those pollen to that flower. Why is that worth something for the flower? Yeah, it doesn't have to pay anything in nectar. Nectar is very expensive to produce. So it just fools the poor insect. And he loses time. The life of an insect is short. So he loses time, he loses energy. The same with the right one. The right one is the dead horse arum. And it smells like a dead horse. It really stinks. And it stinks because it wants to attract these flies. The female fly has a similar label line for this kind of odor because it means here is a good place to lay your eggs. You cannot bypass it. You have to go there. And it's a double deception because this is a hot-blooded plant. So right in the hole there where they want to cheat the fly to go in, it's 37 degrees, just like in a decomposing body. So it really does everything to look like and smell like and feel like a decomposing body. Here is a third example. This is a spider called the bola spider. This is from Kentucky. So this spider makes that little sticky ball and then he puts exactly the odor of one of those moths we talked about before and then he sits swinging it like this. <laughs> female, female, female. <laughs> and then when the male comes close, he just throws that ball, the sticky ball, and he hauls in and he devours the poor guy, right? <laughs> so all of these are examples of, of uh, exploiters, right? Can plants smell? Of course they can. So corn, it's been done a lot of experiments on corn. And we know that when one plant is attacked by insects, it changes its odor and sends a message to the plants nearby telling, I'm under attack, you should turn on your defense systems. So, and you can really use this in agriculture today to prime. So we have priming plants that send out an odor that tells the other plants to start defending themselves. This also holds true underground. Of course, a plant has no nose, it has no brain. So we think that those odors go directly into the genetic transduction mechanism so that the whole constitution of the plant start changing. Plants can also call for help. So when they're attacked by a certain kind of insect, they change their odor and then the enemy of your enemy arrives, the parasitoids, and he starts eating that larva. Not enough with that. The plant can send out different odors depending on which kind of larva is attacking it so that the right kind of enemy comes in. This is research from Gainesville. Florida should be proud. <laughs> Just a final thing about plants. So I worked in Africa for many years. I started in the 90s and I became chair of the board also at that institute. There we have been doing something called push-pull. And it's quite an amazing, or how, how research can come to the use of the small people, of the small farmers, small, small hold farmers. So when we came, corn came to Africa from South America and it became the staple food. But there was a lot of insects in Africa who liked to eat the corn, right? And it became a catastrophe and it went down to about 30 kilos of corn per acre. People were starving. So then we said, what, what could we do about this? So what they did was that they took one of the indigenous hosts for these insects and planted it around the cornfield. And that was so attractive, so it started pulling out the insects from the corn. And then in between the rows of corn, they planted a special kind of bean that the insects really hate the smell of. So that pushed them out. So it was the push-pull system. 
And now we're up to 900 kilos of corn instead of 30. Just totally without any kind. The good thing is also that the bean is a nitrogen fixer. So it, it's, uh, it's like manure at the same time, right? So it, it's just an amazing success. And we now have it f functioning for 150,000 smallhold farmers around the Victoria Lake. So that's how chemical ecology and olfaction can come right out to the people, right? So now I just want to end with two very quick examples of our ongoing research. And I want to touch on the Anthropocene. It's a special project that we have to look at how the, all those gases that we are emitting affect insect chemical communication specifically. So if you look at ozone, the, the blue line here, uh, it's really gone up and we all know it. It's, it's, a, it's a fact, right? So what we started looking at in a special project where also my wife is involved uh, was to a Max Planck Center where, which is our highest level of international collaboration within the Max Planck. And we wanted to look at these different aspects of the system. So the first thing we looked at was the moths and the flowers. We know that moths are extremely important pollinators. You know, we are totally dependent on insects for many, many of our crops. Many of the things you eat will not come about without the insects around, right? So if, if, if we mess that up, it's not good. So we started looking at the interaction between the tobacco hornworm <laughs> and the tobacco flower. So what we looked at was, if you expose that flower to a level of ozone that you find in Miami on a hot day, what happens? Well, ozone is one of the strongest oxidants that we know of. So even to our nose, when we smell that flower after exposing it to that ozone, we can smell that it smells differently. And that's what you see here in, in a chemical way, right? But even more, we saw it when we went into our wind tunnels and we asked the moth to fly to the normal flower and to the one who had been in the Miami City, Miami City for a day. And, and this, this is the moth flying to the normal odor. You must remember this is in total darkness. Yeah, we have an infrared camera looking in here. So the moth cannot see anything, but it can definitely smell the odor that is emanating from that tube. Okay, that worked fine. So then we took the plume coming from the flower that had been in ozone. And this is a movie. Nothing. So when we did the statistics, this is what happened. So the moth didn't find the flower anymore. And this is sort of bad news, because if we send out even more ozone, then we will not get pollination, we will not get any fruit, and so on. So ozonated plumes are not attractive. What about fly sex and ozone? So we thought also many of those pheromones that the insects use to talk to each other, they have double bonds. You see in these molecules here. And double bonds, that's where oxidation happens. It's broken up by the ozone. So we thought maybe things will happen in the interaction between the insects themselves as well. So we took flies and we exposed them to the same level of ozone as I talked to you before. And we could see that it took much longer for the male to be successful with the female, if we put it like that. But even more interestingly, now I will have some movies to show you, and you have to look carefully. So if you look left here now, that will be males that have been sitting in normal air. So it's just normal males of a fruit fly, right? And if you look at them, they're not doing much. Uh, it's only males, there are no girls around, nothing to do, and, and you just sit and wait, right? Then we expose those same males to that ozone for one hour. And then you will see now. And now you have to remember, what does a fly die when, do when he, when he is uh, excited? Well, he starts waving his wings like this. And then he starts running after uh, his friends because they think it's a female. And look here now. So these are all males. And you see, you can even see that they, maybe you can see that they're waving their wings to each other and, and they're really, they now think that all their male friends are females. <laughs> and why? Because the ozone has broken down the pheromone, which is the only sign for another male that you are male. And if it, so for, for a male fly, everything that looks like a fly is a female as long as it doesn't smell of male, right? And here, 
that smell is gone and all the males think that their friends are female. So again, an effect of, uh, of the ozone here. So statistically, yeah, much shorter before this uh, courtship between males happens and the courtship goes up to uh, almost 100% because the males cannot tell it, each other apart anymore. So ozone really destroys this communication system and that's, that's also a little bit bad news, right? And the final story, the, the locus that David was talking about, and that was what I talked about at the Institute before. So we, we know that cannibalism is quite prevalent among locusts. You're all aware of the locust. It's in the Bible. It's in many uh, forever. We know, we know what happens uh, when the big, big swarms occur, right? And what we found there was a special compound called phenylacetonitrile. I will just call it PAN for, not, for short. And, and a colleague of mine, Ian Cassin, has shown that one thing that seems to drive the swarm to constantly move is that if you don't move, you get eaten from behind. Right? That, that's, a, that's a good reason to move. <laughs> so, so then we as chemical ecologists, of course, thought that it would be good to have something to protect you. And then we came onto this compound that we had some idea that it, it might be involved in this. I cannot go into the details now. But then we started using the technology that gave the Nobel Prize in 2020, and I think Emmanuel Charpentier has been here giving this talk as well, and we used genome editing to change the nose of the locust to show how does this happen in the sense of smell. So we went in, we cut out one specific receptor in there, and then we could show that the, you see the red line down there, the locust cannot smell this compound anymore. And the behavior is gone, so it's not repelled. So this pheromone is a cannibalism repellent, an anti-cannibalistic pheromone. So it stops your friends from eating you, right? And we show the way that you could smell it, right? So the reaction in the locust is totally dependent on one single receptor in the nose of the locust. But then we thought the other way around. And this is thinking like a scientist, right? You always have to prove things or, or test things. So we thought, what if we could stop the locust from, from sending out this odor instead? So we went in again with this uh, CRISPR-Cas and we knocked out an enzyme. So we had locusts that didn't smell anymore. They couldn't sm send out the pun. And then we did a little bit of an evil experiment. So we put 50 very hungry locusts in a cage. We hadn't fed them for a day or so. And then we put in two locusts, one who couldn't produce the odor and one who could produce the odor. And then it was very clear that the one who couldn't produce got eaten almost right away and the other one was quite well protected. So then we could sort of dissect the system from both ways. That pun protects the locusts from cannibalism and we showed it both from the nose side and from the production side of, of the insect. So, wrap up. I try to show you how versatile the sense of smell is in a lot of different organisms, right? In your own body, in, in your sense of smell, and in all those animals, in your dog that you associate so closely with at home, and in all those other organisms that might be farther away from you, but still how important the sense of smell is for all these organisms in their life. And we looked at how these different animals have evolved different kinds of strategies to use their sense of smell. And then we p had a peek at how human activities can affect the present smellscape, both, both uh, in the moth and the flower and in the interaction between the flies. And then at the very end, we looked at the locust. So almost at the end, the commercial, all of this occurs in a book. And uh, if you are interested in, in learning more, because this is just a small sample of, of all the things that go on with smelling, then you, on Amazon you find Smelling to Survive. And you can get it in 11 other languages if you want. So, so it's, uh, it's just to choose uh, which one you prefer. So with that, uh, again, so great to be back uh, in Jupiter and at our institute that I love so much. And uh, thank you, David. <laughs>